According to folklore in the WEA, there was um, uh, a, a, an afternoon in the, the kitchen of Albert and Francis Mansbridge, uh, at which they discussed setting up um, an educational association. And in order to get it off the ground, Francis lent Albert two and sixpence out of a housekeeping to uh, do, I suppose, the initial postage costs. The, the reality was that there had been a lot more preparation behind that. Um, Albert Mansbridge and I imagine Francis have been involved in uh, education through cooperative societies and in various other um, uh, settings um, that have brought Albert into contact with people in universities, in the Church of England, in the trade unions. And he had the idea um, that if you could bring together people who were operating in their own separate corners, they would find they had a lot in common. Um, around their aims for working class education or at least breaking down the barriers to that um, access to education. Um, the genius of Albert Mansbridge was he had those connections and a way of bringing people who might not otherwise have met into the same room where they could talk about the things they had in common. People's educational opportunities were so limited um, that unless you followed a self-help method of developing your own educational um, courses, weekend schools, uh, all that kind of thing, um, then there was very little else you could get out of the established education system. Because the system was so biased towards uh, people who were well off and it tended to discard working class people at the age of you know, 9, 10, 11, that, that sort of age range. North East was dependent on uh, very heavy industries of coal, steel making, shipbuilding, that kind of thing. Uh, had a lot of shop workers as well. Um, some, some occupations which I suppose we would now consider, consider white collar. But by and large it was the miners, the shipyard workers, the steel workers who were the bulk of the population of the area. Uh, and they, as you say, had very, very hard lives, long working hours, very tough, physically demanding jobs. Not a lot of outlets for things to do in their leisure times. A lot of the outlets were around drinking. Uh, sport was a big uh, preoccupation then, as it is now, of course. Uh, betting was quite a, quite a major um, uh, way in which people spent their leisure. Um, but many of those people wanted something more out of life than simply those, those, um, uh, th those ways of spending their leisure time. Um, they also wanted to do something that would improve working conditions in terms of reducing working hours, um, improving safety, pay, um, just generally the status of working people in the area. They wanted to do something about improving their housing conditions uh, and educational opportunities for their children as well. And so you found among those populations movements, the Independent Labour Party, the trade unions, particularly the cooperative societies, who had sprung up from within those communities and were about fashioning different ways of doing things, solving some social problems and making a better world. And it's really in that milieu um, that you find the people who began to think about the WEA as one of the vehicles which they might use to achieve some of their aims. But it wasn't easy. The WEA in the North East lagged behind the association in other similar parts of the country. Uh, so by 1910, when the WEA was finally formed in the North East, that was a bit late compared with Yorkshire, the Midlands, the North West and some other parts of the country. And one of the reasons for that was that there had been an explosion of interest in adult education, particularly in the mining communities, in the 1880s. Um, thousands of miners had gone to adult education lectures and classes. Um, but what they'd found was that the kind of education that was on offer uh, was a view of economics, particularly, that suited the employers and the education was used, or the, the view of economics promoted through that adult learning, was used to justify things like wage cuts during periods of trade depression. Uh, there was a huge uh, strike in the mining districts of Northumberland and Durham in the 1880s, um, in which competing versions of how people should deal with an economic crisis 
uh, came to the fore with the employers um, and the university tutors who were providing the adult education arguing that in times of slump people should accept wage cuts and unemployment and the miners unions vigorously contesting that and saying that really you should think more about redistributing the profits of mining and the rest of it. It's uncannily similar to the kind of um, economic debates that are going on a hundred years later with the, uh, the international economic crisis. Um, although the miners didn't win that struggle, um, it, remain, it made an indelible impact on their thinking. Uh, their politics swerved to the left. They gave up on the Liberal Party and started moving towards independent Labour representation, eventually the Labour Party, the independent Labour Party. But one of the big casualties of that episode was that there was a lot of scepticism about adult education. Um, because a view grew up in the mining districts, adult education was about the employers implanting their ideas about economics in the minds of the miners. So Mansbridge and other WEA supporters in the region had to struggle against that prejudice in order to get the WEA established. I think it was there in, in the strength of communal living, the interdependence of people in those heavy industries on each other for their own safety, um, for looking after each other, uh, for sticking together in times of dispute over safety in the pits or the shipyards, um, the, the constant struggles over trade union recognition, over rates of pay, um, particularly in mining, uh, struggles and arguments over rates of pay were a daily occurrence in that way. So you, you learnt solidarity and the value of sticking together in all of that and the power of collective action. And that was then transmitted really out into the wider community. So those same communities in shipbuilding and mining uh, produced huge numbers of local cooperative societies where people came together to buy the goods that they ate or wore. Um, they organised those businesses in ways that the profits came back to the members through a dividend. But they, they, like the mining unions and the other trade unions, were thoroughly democratic structures in which the members elected the committees that ran those organisations. Those committees had to answer for what they, they did sort of back to people. But in participating in those organisations, people became very confident and knowledgeable about really how to run organisations and learn things about themselves and their own abilities that perhaps they wouldn't otherwise have picked up or been encouraged to pick up by uh, many of the employers. Uh, and there's a vast hinterland beyond that in terms of things like the Methodist churches um, that uh, people set up in their communities, um, mutual improvement societies, um, uh, adult schools which were kind of semi-religious but had a, an educational dimension to them and a whole range of social clubs and activities, friendly societies, another one sort of in a sense a homespun social security system that people um, uh, came together to organise themselves in a voluntary and democratic, democratic way. And it's important to note I think within that that women also play quite a big part. Although women weren't um, didn't have a big presence in employment in the northeast uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. That really came, I think, more with the First World War and afterwards. Um, women were very active in the cooperative societies and in all sorts of other mutual support organisations. The northeast during the 19th century had the largest number of female burial societies than any other part of the country. And this was women saving to have a proper funeral for the, themselves and their families. But they organised that themselves. The original name was something like the Association for the Promotion of Education Among Working Men. Uh, well, one of Mansbridge's allies was the Women's Cooperative Guild, which was the largest working class women's organisation in the country and a link into the cooperative movement and they very firmly told him and the others that they needed something that was less gender specific as we would say now. So um, Mansbridge and others in the association very soon changed the name to the Workers' Educational Association to um, it, it was a statement in a way of opening up the association to women as well as men. Um, 
when they were coming into existence as a WEA, it was also in a period which um, had revolutionary and very militant characteristics within the industrial arena. Ed Ed Edwardian Britain is presented through various soporific TV documentaries like Downton Abbey and Upstairs, Downstairs and all of that sort of nonsense. Um, but Edwardian England was in some respects on the verge of revolution. And there is an argument that it was only the First World War that prevented either a revolution or a civil war breaking out over major crises. The campaign for women's suffrage, which became increasingly militant, was one example. Uh, there were huge industrial um, uh, strikes and uh, trade union um, activities based on syndicalism, which was a claim for workers' control of industry going beyond the struggle over wages. Uh, there were major industrial disputes in, in Dublin, Liverpool and elsewhere, which required the military to be sent into the, those areas to, to keep order. Um, there was a gigantic crisis over Home Rule for Ireland, where it looked as though the, um, uh, the uh, part of the army would revolt against the then Liberal government, with backing from the Tory politicians at the time who were in opposition, um, over whether Ireland should be allowed Home Rule. So by the time you get to 1914 and the First World War breaks out, um, there's, a, there's a background against which the WA is operating, operating, which is tearing the, or threatening to tear the country apart. Um, the, the, the First World War has its own impact on the WEA. Um, WEA was quite divided about the First World War. Um, there were numbers of its members and supporters who uh, didn't accept the case for war, thought it was a war of big powers over gold and raw materials and empires. Um, numbers of WA people were pacifists, including the uh, person who became the, uh, I think, the, the, the second district secretary in, in, in the North East, Jack, Jack Trevenna. Uh, he went to prison for his pacifism during the, the First World War. Um, there were others in WEA who felt rather like R.H. Tawney, who was one of our major educational philosophers, who felt that the war was a war against racism and for democracy and therefore had to be fought but out of that war had to come a new social order. Um, so WA had to manage that division quite carefully within its ranks which it succeeded in doing so that when um, Britain moved towards the end of the First World War in 1917-1918 the WA was pretty much to the forefront in terms of advocating educational reform. Uh, it wanted the state to become much more supportive of adult education and it wanted schools to be um, opened up much more widely to children in terms of um, a higher school leaving age, a much broader curriculum for children within the schools. So that movement helped to contribute to new legislation uh, at the end of the First World War and afterwards, um, which achieved its aim in part, but not entirely, because the world then lurched into one of its periodic economic crises and slumps, and that um, meant huge government cuts in education spending, um, and again a fairly sort of bitter industrial and social environment through the 1920s and into the 1930s, in which the WEA grew. Um, it had competitors. Um, one of its competitors was a, a Marxist organisation, National Council of Labour Colleges, which had a more, uh, I suppose, highly politicised approach to adult education and competed with the WEA for financial support from the miners and the, and the co-ops. The two organisations also coexisted, but they were, they, there was a lot of sort of bitter rhetoric between the two of them over the, the, in, the interwar years. Um, and there were big social changes in the interwar war period. Um, uh, I mean, many women, although they were forced out of employment at the end of the First World War, uh, nevertheless had, um, I think, developed much more of an awareness of equality for women and women's rights, and that reflected itself through the, the WEA. So you find many more women becoming involved in the, in the WEA in the interwar period. The WEA also starts to confront 
international crises, the rise of fascism, for example. Hugh Gateskill, who later became leader of the Labour Party, uh, was a WA tutor lecturing on the evils of fascism in Kent in the, in, in the 1930s. Um, but the other thing that WA hung on to in that period was um, its involvement with working class communities. So here in the northeast in the 1930s, you find the WEA bending the restrictions of government funding regulations for adult education to make it possible for the, some of the miners and others in Ashington in Northumberland to become, well, eventually the famous Pittman painters. So they, they set up their art appreciation class, which then became a practical art class. And the rest, as they say, is history, all the way to uh, Lee Hall's play about the Pittman painters. In the 1960s, the period of the, the white-hot heat of the technological revolution, as Harold Wilson was um, supposed to have said, um, that the WA in the North East led a national project on how to promote science and scientific literacy um, uh, among people in their everyday lives. I mean, all that had been completely forgotten, but we discovered that in the, in the archives in some, uh, in some detail. Uh, we, we found out a lot more about um, how people like Sid Chaplin, the North East writer, had been involved with WEA, what that had meant to him. Um, many others in the North East who had written down recollections, fragments of their experience with the WEA, we were able to pull that together. And you could find over that really change and continuity in, in some ways, the sometimes wacky way the WEA as a entirely people-oriented organisation works, uh, that, that had always been there. It has been one of its strengths as well as one of its weaknesses. Um, but we found out a lot about, uh, through that I suppose, how organisations like the WEA have moments when they really flourish and moments when people scratch their heads and wonder if there's any future going on. Um, so you discover over a hundred years you have these peaks and troughs and the way you come out of them is to, and this was a big learning point for me, is that you look at the history and you look at what that tells you about the values and principles of the WEA and you look at how the, you then apply those to modern problems. Because many of the same problems haven't gone away, they've just represented themselves in different forms. Um, I mean, one of those forms classically is is women's education, the access of women to education. And uh, again, that's, we have episodes in our history where the WA has had to really um, get hold of its lapels and shake itself to think about, well, why, aren't, why, aren't we, why are women finding it so difficult to access the things that we do or learning opportunities generally? And usually the WA has responded to that very well. Um, I suppose today, really with perhaps a bit more concern now about how do we engage people who've had little experience or a bad experience of education in formal schooling, how do we get them back into education? Well, the same questions were being um, confronted and allies right back at the beginning. I mean, when I mean, part of the mythology of the WEA is the wonder of the three-year university tutorial classes where um, I suppose the received wisdom about those is that you've got a group of miners, shipyard workers, shop workers together and for three years they follow the university level course in the evenings uh, in a miners hall or a co-op hall and they wrote essays every two weeks and uh, came out of that with a came out of that with a university standard of education. Um, well, many of them did, uh, but buried away in the records is the fact that Tawney and others had also to teach people how to read and write to deal with essays. Um, they had to do the basics, just as we have to do them, uh, have to do them today. And, and the really big thing that I learned, I, th I think really from just revisiting Mansbridge, was what a terrific organiser he was and how his view of the WEA was that you, you constantly reach out to people, you, you make the organisation a home for anybody else who has an interest in education. Um, and so we've done that in our own practice here in terms of some of the ways we, we've engaged with what for us are sort of fairly new items, you know, how do you conduct adult education around 
big environmental issues like climate change and sustainability, uh, well, one of the ways you do that is that you link up with other organisations, trade unions, the co-op, um, green movements, transition towns, networks, and you, you create a, an organisational unit within the WEA or, an e or plan an event that also involves them in helping plan that event. And uh, so you, you build the networks. We, we use the word networks. Mansbridge had the word federal, I think, which was a Edwardian term for network, I think. I sort of realised that once we started looking at, uh, at what he had done.